This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam and I'm your host. And this week on the podcast, we have Mark Clifton. He is the lead national strategist for revitalization and replanting at the North American Mission Board. God has used Mark to lead in the planting and replanting of more than a dozen churches across the United States and Canada. And we've actually broken this conversation up into two parts. So this is part one of Richard's conversation with Mark. Uh, Richard and Mark have actually uh, done a lot of conferences together and they speak across the country uh, in in various capacities and to associations. This is a great conversation uh, for anyone who's involved in the local church uh, in whatever capacity. They're going to talk a lot about churches that have plateaued or are in decline. Um, a large percentage of churches are, are in those categories. But even if your church is not in that category, there are some great insights as to what you can do, uh, signs to be looking for to avoid becoming a church that is plateauing or, de- or declining. And uh, I hope you will enjoy part one of Richard's conversation with Mark Clifton. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the podcast here today. And as those of you who listen to our podcast know, one of the favorite things I do is interview uh, leaders, influencers, people who are making a difference uh, in the world today. And I'm especially excited uh, today because I get to interview a friend and a colleague, someone that uh, I work with uh, often, and that's uh, Mark Clifton. Mark is, um, he works at the North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, and his responsibility is uh, to help with church revitalization. And if you don't know what that term means, it means when churches are struggling, declining, perhaps even facing closing down, they bring in Mark and his team, and uh, they are seeing (laughs) remarkable results of churches that have experienced decline for years, many of them down to just a handful of, of people left. Uh, and uh, and they uh, Mark comes in and uh, helps with his team to give them a new vision of what God could do, and uh, basically start over. Oftentimes, and uh, and we've seen just some miraculous, uh, incredible results. And so, Mark, thanks for joining well, thank us this you. morning. I love I love hanging out with you, Richard. Love getting to travel around the country once in a while and speak with you. And uh, you know, you and I both love the local church. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's 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 such a wonderful, uh, glorious place. But the reality of it is, in North America, every single year there are four thousand churches that close their doors. Wow. Four thousand every single year. Mm. Um, and you know, maybe maybe. 80 percent somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of churches are plateaued or declining but but over 50 percent of churches are really in decline yeah. you just kind of think about that for a minute i mean in in north america where we we still have incredible freedom of religion and we're we're seeing churches over 50 percent more than 50 percent in in decline and and they've got uh, plenty of resources available to them yes, all, all kinds compared of to the rest of the world yeah, compared to the rest of the world, financial resources, buildings, uh, full-paid staff, seminary-trained leaders, and we're, we're half of them, more than half, are in, you know, are in decline. You know, if you, if you go to any city, this everyone knows this. In almost about any place where someone lives, there's a handful of churches that are really growing, and some of them are really, really large. And there's another handful of churches that are kind of holding their own. But the majority of churches, if you were to pull in their parking lots and, and walk in there on Sunday morning, they would have far less in gathered worship than they had 20 or 25 years ago. They, there is a, an incredibly challenging and frightening, really, um, decline. Now, I was listening to a book on tape last night. I was flying back from Los Angeles, and I was listening to a book on tape and uh, about Harry Truman, actually, hmm. and because uh, I'm from Independence, Missouri. And he, when Harry ran for president in in uh in the, the the first time he ran on his own which would have been in 48 the princeton survey said 94 percent of americans in 1948 professed a strong belief in god hmm. and a strong belief in really what you would call judeo-christian values um and that was when many of our churches did really really well when yeah. we were playing for the home team so to speak culturally uh, obviously that's not the case today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously not even we're near. And so a lot of our churches don't know how to play in a hostile environment. Mm. They just, they're completely foreign to them. And, uh, yeah. Well, so well, you again, know, you know, 
And I, it's sad. I mean, when you when you watch the news today, when you watch society, uh, d- teenage depression, suicide, all those kind of things, th- this is a time when the church needs to be stepping up its game, when the church needs to have more influence uh, and doing more than it ever has. And yet it's, it's unbelievable that perhaps 80% or more of churches are, if at best they're holding their own, they're, they're not, they're either declining or they're, they're not, certainly not growing. And so I, Mark, two things maybe to ask. One is just how do churches get there? Like how you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit there already, but churches that used to grow, I mean, churches that used to have 600 seat auditoriums, thousand seat auditoriums, and now they've got less than 10 people showing up. How do you, you don't get there overnight. Uh, how do you, how do you get to a place where a church is uh, becoming seemingly irrelevant to its community, where it's not reaching anyone. Um, and, and maybe, you know, I mean, obviously if you've got 10 people left in an auditorium of 600, you know, there's a problem, but, um, but also what are, what are some signs, you know, maybe, I mean, there might be some listeners saying, well, I go to a church. I mean, we're not lighting the town on fire, but I'm not sure if we're in trouble yet. Um, what might be some signs that, okay, you, you may not be at death's door yet, but you're moving in that direction over time. Well, let, let me, let me talk for a second about death's door real quick. Uh, <laughs> I, in my, in my world, I work for the Southern Baptist convention and we have 45 thousand churches. We're the, we're the largest denomination in the world. So 45,000 churches in North America, actually 47 or 48,000, something like that. But every single year, we realize the closure of eight to 900 churches every single year. Richard, in 10 years, that's eight or 9,000 Southern Baptist churches. Hmm. And when, when we dug down and looked at the numbers, it was frightening you ready for this? 78% of the churches that closed were in metropolitan areas of over 100,000 people. Hmm. And even more, even more amazing than that, 90%, 90% of the churches that closed were in communities that grew in population in the previous decade. Wow. So we're seeing churches close, not where, you know, out in the boonies where nobody lives, we're seeing the majority of our churches close in cities that are growing in population. Hmm. And that just, that makes it even more astounding. So your question is, you know, what are some of the warning signs of a church that's, a, that's, that's heading in the wrong direction? And you're right, nobody wakes up one morning and, you know, you're running 150 in gathered worship or 200, and you go, you know what, we're going to, you know, this year's our last year. We're just going to, we're just going <laughs> to, I mean, sometimes there's a vicious split or a moral failure or something that happens in a church. But even in those cases, Richard, I mean, the risk in Christ is better than all of that. And he he can bring something amazingly good even out of bad situations. So yeah. uh, there's really no human thing that can happen that, that Jesus can't fix in a church. So mm-hmm. what happens is really, first and foremost, they quit following Jesus and his plan for their church. Mm. And they start creating their own plan for their church. Yeah. And they engage in their plan. And Jesus may have something very different in mind for that church, but they like what they're doing and they like how they're doing it. Mm. And they convince themselves they're doing it for Jesus, but they're not doing what he wants them to do. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what's, what's always amazing to me is, I mean, sometimes they've been following their plan for years and it's led to decline and yet they, they still hold on to that plan. I mean, it's like as the ship is sinking and the water is, is rising, they still are convinced that their plan is the best. And uh, well, we have, we have about 12 or 14 characteristics of dying churches. And one of them is they anesthetize the pain of death with unnecessary and unproductive activity. Hmm. And so if we, if we just stay busy, we can't be dying because we're busy, (laughs) you know, and if we stay busy, it's not our fault if we're dying because we're still staying busy. Yeah. And but I, we're not I, doing what Jesus wants to do. Yeah, I mean, our, our church is running a third of what it was five years ago, but I, I went to three committee meetings this week. So, I mean, we, we must yeah. be doing something right. Right, exactly. And we still have Sunday school, even though there's not as many people there. And we still have business meetings and we still meet three times a week for worship. And, you know, we still do. And, and yet nothing is really, there's no real impact on the community. And, and I, I really think, you know, again, what the, some of the other characteristics is the church begins to disconnect from its immediate community around it. 
Hmm. And they're no longer part of the fabric of the community. Hmm. And really, a couple of really telling indicators, Richard, is if your church closed this week and it never opened again, if the only people that felt that was tragic were the members of your church, that's a problem. Yeah. Because yeah. your presence in that neighborhood, in that community, in that city should have a positive impact on people. If you're truly disciples of Christ and you're the most generous people in the community, the most caring people in the community, the most loving people in the community, look, if if they don't notice if you're gone, what's that tell you about what you're doing? It tells you you're turned in on yourself. It's yeah. exactly what it tells you. And, uh, and, and if you I go say so many churches, it's all about we can just get people to come into our building and, and, and sit in our worship service. And it's all attractional. It's uh, well, we've got this beautiful building. We've got stained glass windows. Uh, we've got a great organ. Why is it that pe- people in the community don't seem to care about worship? Why don't they want to come in here? But uh, but but typically a church like that is not strategically going out in the community and meeting neighbors and providing things that the neighbors actually seem to care about. And to realize, as I said before, we we don't have the home team advantage anymore. Hmm. And I'm from Kansas and and uh, uh, live out here now in the middle of Kansas. And of course, KU is a really you know really great basketball at school. And so, you know, back, back in the forties and fifties, when my father was a pastor, uh, it was like KU played every game at home in Allen Fieldhouse, right? They still had to play the game, but everybody in the stands was cheering for him. You know, I come along in the, in the seventies and eighties and nineties and, you know, and now in, in those years and it, it, it transitioned. It was like KU playing at a neutral setting, hmm. but right now I'm, I'm pastoring still at this point. And it's like KU playing every game at Duke. I mean, the, the, the culture's not cheering for us. It's not rooting for us, mm. which has always been the case, by the way, for the majority of the years, 2,000 years of the church. And we can do our best ministry in a hostile environment because, by contrast, we can show that we love people anyway. We care for people anyway. Uh, you know, we're, we, we live by a different standard than a hostile, violent world. But what happens is many of these churches are just turned in on themselves. They're afraid of the world. They don't like the world. They wish the world were different, hmm. you know, and and rather than to say, hey, this is the time that God has placed you here, and he wants you to, to be in this world. He wants you to love it and be salt and light in this world. And they, they just refuse to do that, hmm. and they refuse to be part of the fabric of the community. You know, a friend of mine, he's a he, he's at Midwestern Seminary. He's a great writer, Jared Wilson. I remember one time he said, I think some Christians don't really care if people become Christians or not. They just wish everybody would straighten up and act right. <laughs> and I, yeah. I just think, you yeah. know, we just we say we, we care about our, you know, our, our country and our community. But do we really care about their souls, or are we just angry that they don't live and act the way we think good people ought to live and act? Mm. And there's a huge difference, Richard, in that, huge difference in that. And I think we've lost some of the compassion for a dying world, and we've almost begun to resent the, the world that's out there. And yeah. that resentment is another sign of, of a dying church. When you resent the community for not responding to you, Jesus didn't put that in your heart. Yeah, and I, you know, I, 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 it always strikes me when I go by a, a little church uh, out in a, in a neighborhood somewhere, and they've got a sign, and the sign says "Visitors Welcome," and it, it, <laughs> you want to say, "We're we're a friendly church. We we welcome visitors, and uh, we just don't understand why no one wants to visit." Um, and uh, it, it it often just kind of shows that you're 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 really not aware of what people and of course people who aren't aren't believers who don't know Christ they they don't even really know what their real needs are but but their felt needs the way you're going to engage them initially you've got to connect with where they are what they what what they're struggling with what they need and oftentimes we don't even know uh, what what's going on in our neighborhood and uh, well and the neighborhoods are constantly churning and changing that's another thing I mean. 40 or 50 years ago, a young couple would, you know, a guy come back from military. Uh, he would, you know, get a job at, at an automotive company, automotive plant. They'd buy a house and they'd stay there for 25 or 30 years. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the, the community and the church was relatively stable. Yeah. 
today, every community is always churning. It's always changing. The dynamics are changing. And after a while, that becomes so frustrating for churches to try to keep up with the changing act from the community, like I said. And you, we've just noticed it over and over again, where churches are not part of the fabric of the community. And when they do that, that's a real step in the wrong direction. And it, it doesn't happen overnight, but eventually it gets let me give you a, a good example. So think about with me, ran about 400 to 500. It was at its biggest. I mean, it it was it was like this church did everything right. Uh, it it just it was just an amazing place, and and I know it personally. I'm very familiar with it. But by the time you know 2015 comes around, they're down to 40 people. It, it, it started in the 1980s, and it just took about 20, 25, 30 years. They lose about 10 or 15 percent a year, and they got down to about 40 sweet, loving, caring, mostly elderly people. All right. So they they called me and asked me to come and and, and be their transitional pastor for a while, and. They loved Jesus. They truly did. And they even loved their community, but their community had changed dramatically in 30 years. What used to be just really solid middle-class neighborhoods was now low-income and really transient neighborhood. A lot of those bigger homes had been cut up into apartments, and, and, and actually there were two halfway houses within walking distance of the church, drug houses for, for drug rehab, halfway houses. So every week, this dear, this dear church would, would, would give away food and clothing, and they gave a lot of food and a lot of clothing away. And then on Sunday morning, once in a while, some of the people from the halfway house or some of the people from the neighborhood would actually show up on ch at church because when they gave away the food and the clothes, they would say, hey, would you come? Would you come? And so when they walked in the door, Richard, these older folks loved them and embraced them and said, oh, we're so glad you're here. They would sit with them. And then when they got ready to leave, the only thing these older folks knew to do was to say, oh, please come back next week. Well, it, if you're addicted to mess, if you're struggling with alcohol addiction, if you're a single mom and you're in an abusive relationship and, and you've got a child that's got some special needs, come back next week's not enough, right? Hmm. I mean, you got you got to get in their life. It, it, it's, it's very much like the Samaritan. You, you got to have compassion. You got to kneel down. You got to bandage up their wounds. You got to spend the night with them, so to speak. You got to spend money on them. And I, I, a lot of these churches just don't even know how to begin to do that. They just, you're right, attractional. They say, hey, come back next week. And and, and it, it, it's, it takes a lot more in many of these neighborhoods to, to minister to people than it used to a few decades ago. And I think that's what they're really sensing. And some of them just don't have the, the physical ability to do that, which is why it's important for these dying churches to reach out to other churches and say, hey, we're ready to let go. Hmm. And you, we're ready to let you come in and, and really kind of help, help maybe even take us over. Because even if people show up, we don't have the ability anymore, the time or even the physical strength to minister to them the way we need to. And that's, but that's, Richard, that's hard for a church to do, isn't it? Yeah, but unfortunately, many dying churches would rather hang on to their control and not minister to people than to give up control and let some others come in and do the ministry. So, and I, yeah. and I find a lot of times the whoever, maybe a couple of prominent deacons or leaders of some kind, you know, core families, uh, they've been in, they've been kind of running the church for 20, 30 years, and it's it's declined almost to nothing left, and yet they still feel like they know better than anybody else how that church needs to go. And oh, def sometimes yeah, sometimes you have to just look at the the fruit of your leadership. You've got to look at okay, I, I've kind of been in charge. My family's been in charge for two decades, and now we're running a you know a quarter what we used to. Maybe my leadership and my ideas are have, are not as good as I thought they were. And uh, yeah. it's a it's a hard thing to kind of admit that that hey we've been here this whole time uh, in this decline and uh, maybe we just we need help and we, we need counsel we need other ideas. Let me give you an amazing story. I may have shared this with you at one time. I probably did, but this was back in the '90s when I was serving in the two states of Kansas and Nebraska as the state missions leader for those two states. And there was a church that had declined to a, a less than a dozen people. 
and it was in a it was in a it was in a community for Kansas that was a large community of over over twenty five thousand folks, and it was the building was a relatively new building, and it was in a new subdivision surrounded by new homes for goodness sake, but it declined to less than twelve people, and so uh, as the state missions leader, we had many conversations with this church about. There's some other churches that would like to come in and, and help you, but you're going to have to give up day-to-day control. These other churches will come in, bring in leadership, bring in ministry, and, and we can re- reignite this, replant this, right? Well, they refused. And they got, they got rather angry at us. They said, you just want to take us over. You just, it's like you just said. And they, they said, uh, interesting enough, they, they liked your dad. <laughs> and they'd been to hear Henry speak at different conferences. And so they said, well, we're going to write Henry Blackaby because Henry Blackaby says, you know, that, you know how people would put words in his mouth uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, God can do anything and, and he can do it here. So they wrote this letter to Henry, <laughs> your dad, and he wrote it back. And I wish I, I wish I had a copy of it, but trust me, I remember it. <laughs> uh, they brought it to me. It was like a paragraph. And it was like, because they described their whole church. And he said, you know, and your dad just very bluntly said, you know, the Lord has spoken to you. And just what you said, clearly what you're doing is not working. And if others are willing to help you, that is Jesus showing you what he wants to do. And you need to let them do it. And they were just a stand. They still didn't do it. Right. <laughs> but, they, <laughs> but it was just, it was typical of your dad, just that brief one paragraph basically saying what was really obvious to everybody you know yeah if, if it were working it would be working but it's it going the wrong direction right. and i remember one time your dad said if if your church dies did it follow jesus into the grave hmm. and that's kind of what he said to this group and so uh yeah just kind of interesting anecdote there about that and we you know i just i'm such a believer in uh, god raising up leaders and uh and the hard thing for leaders is to admit the way I've been leading is not effective. I, I may love Jesus. I may, and, and a lot of these folks, they work really hard and they, yeah. they, they really believe in God, but they, they're just misguided in what it's going to take. And, uh, and they, they really need their leadership to go to another level. And, and I find sometimes it's really hard for pastors, especially because if, if you know, and you, and, and, um, you and I, uh, get to do uh, conferences all over the country, where we can encourage uh, pastors and church leaders to, to gather for a day and just be inspired, encouraged by uh, how God might want to turn their ministry, their church around. But interestingly, oftentimes, you know, we'll, I, I can remember several times where you and I have been in a conference somewhere and a, a regional uh, director of missions or something comes up and, and he'll just, I, I, I can't tell me, and you know this, uh, they'll come and they'll say, Wow, this has been great. Uh, boy, Richard, you and Mark are just really just spot on what what we need to hear. But but then they'll say, uh, but I know two, three pastors, probably the most hurting pastors, hurting churches in this whole area, and they live within two miles of this meeting place, and none of them came. The, the, yeah. And you think, well, why is it that the people who need the help the most, whose churches are hurting the most, are often the ones that don't reach out and get help? They they just sort of hunker down and. Uh, say that, you know, no, we, for whatever reason, I'm, they're too busy. They, they don't think they'd learn anything or we don't, we don't know their situation. You know, we probably don't know what we're talking about. And, uh, and literally the church dies by the, by the hundreds across America and across denominations by the thousands churches are dying every year. And they're not dying for lack of people offering help. Even as I say that on this podcast, there are churches saying, no, no, wait a minute. We've asked for help. What they mean is we ask for people and money, but we're not going to relinquish any leadership. Systemic problems that are driving you into the ditch. Yeah, and I, I mean and I, that, that's just not good stewardship. It's not wise. And I, I know it's hard for leaders because they'll say, "Well, what we just need is some funding. If you if you just give us enough money so we could hire a youth pastor or something, right. we could turn things around." And yet you'd say, "But the the reason you're you need financial help is because you've been leading in a in an unhealthy way that has weakened your church to the point you 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 can only survive with handouts and." And so to say, it's hard to, to, to put good money after after bad leadership. And uh, people don't want to change how they lead. They just want you to subsidize. Well, their... and, and it's, it's hard. It's... Yeah. And it's it's really hard to hear this, Richard. But the reality is if a church says we don't have any 
the young people, we need to hire a, work, uh, a youth leader, the first question they have to ask themselves is, what have we done that have made this place a place where young people don't feel like they can, they can hang out? Yeah. What have we done? What decisions did we make or what decisions did we not make? You know, what is it about our church that we have to hire someone to try to bring in a particular age group? Mm. Um, I mean, that that's the basic root problem is is that. Yeah. And, and you can't you, you can't hire someone to do what Christ has asked you to do. You, you have a youth leader when when your church begins to reach young people. and You go, wow, this is there's so many here. We, we got to start. We got to add some staff. Huh. It's not like, OK, we got to get staff in order to get this to happen. Yeah, that's not a New Testament model <laughs> at all. Well, you know, I think uh, Mark, one of the things you've said that I think are just um, so, uh, so important to hear. Uh, and I, I, I it's it speaks so much to what I'm seeing. You, you, you said, and I, I still give you credit. I know sometimes you quote me and don't give me credit, but, <laughs> but I try to always quote you on this one. You, <laughs> you, uh, you, you said uh, your, your church is perfectly designed to get the results it's currently getting. And I just yes. think that's just one of the most profound statements. Um, I wish I'd said it, but uh, <laughs> but, 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 but exactly when, uh, when you see a church that has no young people, and they'll say, but we love young people. We would love to have teenagers filling our building. Uh, we don't know what the problem is. You would say, but but you're not designed to attract and keep young people. If you were, right. they'd be coming. Uh, yeah. you're, you're, if, if your church is filled with elderly people, then that's probably because your church sings music that elderly people like to sing. And you've got a church governance model that elderly people feel comfortable with. And you, and you provide services like potlucks and... And, and other things that the elderly enjoy and, and all the same programming that they grew up with when they were young. And so you get, you're getting the results. And, and, and the problem is that, I, and, and I've just heard you say this so many times, is that we want different results, but we don't want to change our design, our, the way we do things. And so right. why, how, how can we just keep doing what we've always done, but just get different results? And <laughs> we, we, we can't. And, you know, um, you know, you wrote an amazing book, you and your dad, that uh, that has really, really impacted this issue of revitalization. Uh, I knew it was going to be good, Richard, but I didn't really know it'd have this much traction. Hmm. Of course, it's flickering lamps, and it's just been incredibly well received among our our group of folks in Southern Baptist life. And it's it's a picture, obviously, of looking at and. Really it all begins with with the church in Ephesus where going on you believe in sound doctrine you work really hard you toil long you care about my namesake Richard that's every Southern Baptist dying church I've ever seen hmm. they care about solid doctrine they work really hard they care about the namesake of Jesus and those are all good things if you can't do those you're not going to do the others so those aren't things to ignore but then obviously the, the risen Christ says, but this I have against you. And he says, you've got to remember how far you've fallen, repent and return to those things you did at first. Now, growing up hearing that sermon preached, I always heard it. You've lost your first love. You got to get back to loving Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, when dying churches hear that, they immediately think, well, that's not us. We love Jesus, mm -hmm. right? That's why we come every Sunday. That's why we love the hymns. That's why we're, we love Jesus. And, and they, they, they very well may, but he's not talking. I don't think the risen Lord's talking there about you don't love me anymore because he says you work hard for my namesake. He says you, those things you did at first. Well, you go back to the book of Acts in 18 and 19, and 50 years prior, like one generation prior, you think about it. Maybe some of these people in the church of Ephesus, when the church started and they were first converted, were in their 20s, and now they're in their 70s. Imagine that. And so he says, go back to what you did at first, which is in the— chapters 18 and 19 of acts they started a riot in ephesus i mean they <laughs> everybody in the region had heard the gospel and in starting a riot in a roman occupied city you were probably going to get arrested maybe hauled off as a slave maybe killed lose your job they didn't care they wanted to share the gospel and in my mind in my heart the implication is the church in ephesus had turned in on itself mm. cared about doctrine cared about being who they were but did no no longer did the things they did at first. Hmm. And I think that's the reason churches die. We quit doing those things we're called to do to, to, to make, make, meet needs in the community, share the gospel with everybody with great abandon at great cost to ourselves and even great personal 
personal risk. We just don't like to take risk anymore. Whenever you talk to a church about reaching the community, how much is it going to cost? How do we know it's going to work? Why do people tear up our building? You know, all, all you know, people are going to take advantage of us. Like, where did all that come from? <laughs> Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackv.org.